A lot, of, a lot of people believe they have a moral obligation, starting with Woodrow Wilson, that we had to prove to the world that uh, uh, we were the most moral and, and, and most uh, wise nation, and we had, the, we had the right and the obligation to force our way and, uh, and, and to teach other people. They, this, this, though, doesn't work. Using force to force our goodness on a, anybody cancels out all the goodness. If you... Now, America, America has been a great country, the freest and the richest, and we have a, a lot of wonderful traits and wonderful characteristics that we want to. But why don't we concentrate on a free market economy, a sound currency, protection of civil liberties, a sensible foreign policy, and then we could be a nation where other countries would want to emulate us and follow our lead. <laughs> But unless we change our attitude, and that means the people, about how, how much we should be involved overseas, it's not going to happen. We're going to work to the bankruptcy, and that's not real far off. So my, my position is that it should be a lot easier for liberals and conservatives and independents to come together and cut overseas spending and cut these wars. That's what I think would be the easiest thing to cut. Which, which simply means we bring our troops home as soon as possible. The other thing about this is that um, it's a way to work our way out of it. If we don't work our way out of it and have a dollar collapse, everybody's checks bounce. And, and then you have political chaos, and then I worry about our civil liberties. But if, uh, if we do this sensibly and cut this spending overseas, what, what about all this effort to worry about a border that nobody can identify between Pakistan and Afghanistan? Think of how much fighting and killing we're going over there. Nobody even knows where at all, so we just bomb everybody. You know. But uh, what, about, what about our own borders uh, to, to the south? We, you know, there, there's a responsibility of the federal government. We could do that with a lot less resources than worrying about all those overseas borders. And in the last five years, it is estimated that 50,000 people have been killed on that border down there. And uh, it involves not only, uh, I think, less so the immigration problem than our failed policy on the drug war, I think, is part of the reason. But we once again would have to change our foreign policy and, and adapt the policy that the founders gave us. Part of the last century, many conservative Republicans endorsed. And that is, that we ought to mind our own business. And, uh, <laughs> But they'll come up with all, all these arguments, well, there's a civil war going on there and people are getting killed. They have no idea who the good guys and the bad guys are. There's probably bad guys on both sides, but we have to get involved, they say. But how many, how many times did we get involved with the most vicious of dictators, you know, from uh, Stalin to Mao Zedong and all these people? They killed millions, and yet we did business with them. So this whole idea that we, the, there's war propaganda going on, war drums are beating, they're ready to go into Syria. We don't need a war in Syria and we don't need a war in Iran, I'll tell you that.
Now, the, the, the big economic advantage of this, if we decide to work our way out, which is what I'm working to do, and that is if you cut back, you don't have to cut child health care or you don't have to cut benefits to the elderly. Some of those programs should never have been started. I'm not going to defend this stuff on constitutional grounds, but on practical grounds, if you want to deal with this and deal in a practical way, let's cut this spending overseas and try to take care of the people that we have taught for 50 years to become dependent on the federal government and then work our way out. One of the proposals in my bill is to take care of the people who are dependent and, and need to help, but I would offer the chance you know, to, to uh, change the Social Security system and, for instance, to start off with anybody under 25 getting out of college. Let them get out of Social Security. Let them take care of themselves. Now that, of course, wouldn't work unless you do the cutting, and that's why we have to change the foreign policy. But the founders were very, very clear on this, and, uh, uh, and they advised strongly, don't get involved in entangling alliances, don't be the policeman of the world, and don't, uh, uh, don't get involved. But their advice was trade with people and talk to people and, uh, and, and not try to solve all, the, all their other problems. But uh, today we, we do exactly the opposite. I think one of the most foolish examples of putting on sanctions uh, uh, not at the time, but now. Don't you think sanctions on Cuba have been long enough? <laughs> Other countries are doing business with them. Communism is dead. What I'm worried about is the current system of government interventionism and inflationism and the problems we have today. That's our real threat. Besides, Besides, the countries that we do end up trading with, you know, we, the French and the Americans uh, killed a million, uh, probably close to a million or more of the Vietnamese. We finally left. We lost 60,000. And we lost that war. And they said there would be a domino effect and communism would spread throughout the world. It didn't happen. China became our banker. Now we do business with the Vietnamese. And, uh, and, and just think of what's happened since we left there in the 1973 or so. Since we've left there, Think of what happened it, with peace would never happen with war. So why are we so determined, this country, to think that it is necessary? And you know, there's an economic theory behind this, which is a dangerous theory. They, the, the claim was that the Depression came because of the gold standard and capitalism. But they didn't, we didn't get out of the Depression until we had World War II. Now that is foolish thinking because war never helps your economy. It never helps. Now, the reason, the reason of the fallacy is there was, the unemployment rate went down, you know, because everybody was over the 10 million people went overseas fighting. But a lot of people argue me about, uh, with me about my $1 trillion of cut in spending because they've been taught, the Keynesian teaches, government's supposed to spend more money when, when you're in trouble. And uh, uh, they, they said that uh, if you do this, won't this really hurt the economy? But, but think, think about it, if, um, if, you have a, if you have a trillion dollars and you cut it, of course, the, uh, the people are gonna get to cut it. But after World War II, 10 million military people came home. We cut the budget by 60%. Taxes went down 30%. That's when the Depression ended. They came back. That's what we, that was the Depression. But when we come around to understanding that we do have a responsibility for strong national defense, we have to have a strong national defense, but the founders tried their best to protect us against the king going to war. But unfortunately, the presidents we've had in recent history have acted like kings, have not gotten the permission from you through your congressmen voting up and down for a war. And if we did that, we wouldn't have gone to war. And if we had to go to war, we'd fight them with them and they would come home. You know, the, the Iraq war was fought, uh, you know, as a consequence or a sequence from 9-11. It had nothing to do with 9-11 because there was no weapons of mass destruction, no uh, al-Qaeda there. But when they came up with the resolution, I'm, I was on the Iraq, uh, on the International Relations Committee, the resolution said, not a, dec a declaration of war, they said the president can do whatever he wants. 
Essentially that. If you want to go to war, fine. If you don't, you don't have to. And that was how they reneged on the responsibility, which sort of upset me a bit. And uh, so I introduced a, a substitute resolution and said, okay, I, I told the, the committee, I said, look, you guys want to go to war? I don't want to go to war. But I'm offering a resolution of a declaration of war. I said, I'm not going to vote for it, but if you want to go to war, you vote it up and down. Of course, oh, they were furious. Oh, no. And then they did voice vote and voted down. I said, I'm going to make you record the vote that you voted against the declaration of war. <laughs> but it was explained to me by the committee chairman of the time that they were trying to uh, explain to me the Constitution. They say, he said, that part of the Constitution is anachronistic. We don't follow that part of the Constitution anymore. That tells you why we're in trouble today, because the Constitution doesn't mean a whole lot. They ignore it, they, the courts overrule it, and uh, it's, a, it's a real mess. We got into this mess by not following it. We could get out of it by sending only people to Washington that will obey the Constitution. The other the other serious consequence of big government, whether it's uh, for the entitlement welfare system or for the warfare system, because the bigger the government gets, the smaller the people get, the less liberties that we have. It's characteristic under a war that civil liberties are compromised. People, people have uh, sort of accepted this idea, well, under these special emergency conditions, we have to give up a little bit of our liberties. Let me tell you, you don't. You don't have to give up liberties to be safe.